Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Emlois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. Good morning. That was not a very nice encounter of physics and uh, our hearing physiology. And if you're wondering why we still cringe when we listen to Mozart's little fun that he was poking on his fellow musicians, well, blame your ears for it because our ears are the most discriminative organ that we have. Unfortunately, we can pick out that little flat note or that little sharp note when uh, our children or our grandchildren try to play the violin. We are more sensitive in our hearing sense than uh, in any of our other senses, and we have a wonderful dynamic range. And so, lend me your ears for the next 45 minutes or 50 minutes, and I will tell you about hearing. I can tell you what we can hear, I will tell you how we hear, and I will give you some pointers how you can make sure you lose your hearing. I will also let you listen to the sound of hearing loss, and then I will end by talking about stress and dying and remedies and promises. So let me start out after we've already experienced the wonderful discriminatory nature of our auditory system, let me show you what the range is that we can hear, because we probably do not realize it. This is a dB scale. So the proverbial pin dropping is 15 dB. And this goes then to 55 for a conversation and 110, 133 for very, very high level noise. So what is the difference in energy between those? This is a logarithmic scale. And here is the relative sound energy. We can listen to tones that represent an energy of one to about one trillion. One trillion. One trillion, one to one trillion. That's the difference between the cash you have in your pocket and the federal debt. So, <laughs> And this, <clears throat> this range is unequaled by any of our other uh, sensory systems. Well, let's go on. What does it take to stimulate the ears? If we set the energy that it takes to produce a sound sensation at one, olfaction, when an odorant molecule combines with our olfactory uh, receptors, that generates 170 times more energy. And the excitation of vision by photons is about 800 times more energy requiring than sound. So, in other words, cherish what you have and try to preserve it. First of all, I would like to introduce you a little bit to what's happening in our ears so you understand how we understand. The external ear, we all know that. But what you might not know is that your ears, your external ears, your pinna, actually participate in analyzing the sound and in hearing. And you can, with just the curvature of your ears, you get a very personalized impression of the world of sound. If you had somebody else's ears attached to your head, you would hear slightly differently. Also, 
These are wonderful hearing aids. Did you ever try this? If you just turn to the uh, nearest loudspeaker, and if you cup your hands behind your ears, and I will keep talking as I do at the same, you will see, hear that I'm amplified. So these are wonderful hearing aids that we have built in, into our uh, head. So the sound that hits the ear will travel through the ear canal and will come to the ear drum. Now this is all still a lot of physics. The sound waves that hit the uh, uh, ear drum will start to make the ear drum vibrate. And this vibration is then transferred to the trivial pursuit bones. Anybody here? <laughs> you, you've, had, you've had that question, the trivial pursuit, right? Yeah? Oh, yeah. Good. Um, the, the question is, what are the three smallest bones in your body? The three smallest bones are the middle ear bones, are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, with dimensions of about three to uh, five millimeters. From there, the sound will go on to the inner ear, to the cochlea proper, the organ of hearing, a coiled organ aptly named after the Greek word for snail, since it's coiling around for about two, two and a half, two and a half turns uh, in the human. And this is actually where the transduction of the phys physical stimulus of sound into the nerve impulse occurs, and the nerve will then carry the impulse to the brain. So if we take a closer look at our hearing organ, it unfortunately is not so colorful as it is on this uh, picture. But what you see here are these coils, the three coils, or two and a half coils, of a cochlea. They're all fluid filled. They're filled with fluids. Imagine a garden hose just going uh, two and a half turns. And embedded in these fluids is something that I would like to um, point your attention to. And that is the organ of Corti, discovered by Alfonso Corti in 1851. He discovered it while he was uh, working in Würzburg in Germany. And following this discovery, which is one of the milestones in hearing research and anatomy, he decided, after publication of his thesis, he decided to go back to Italy and tend to the vineyards of his fathers, and he was lost for science forever. Anyway, but he gave us the legacy of knowing about the organ of Corti, where actually the input of sound is transduced, translated into what we can hear. And as we look at such a cross-section of the uh, organ of Corti, I would like to draw your attention to three structures within this arrangement. So this is the arrangement that coils two and a half times around our inner ears. And the important part of course, they are supporting structures, so everything stays in place and everything is uh, perfectly in order. But the important parts are what we call the hair cells, the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells with stereocilia, hairs on them. That's why they're called hair cells. And I will certainly show you more about this. And they are surrounded by fluids. So this part of the organ of Corti here is surrounded by fluids. And what's happening when the sound hits the cochlea and eventually a nerve impulse travels to the brain was very uh, aptly described by Georg von Beckeschi, the only Nobel laureate we have in the hearing field. And what he measured and showed was that as the sound hits the eardrum, and the ossicles start moving, a wave travels through our cochlea. So the fluids start waving through the cochlea. And remember, this organ of Corti with the sensory cells was surrounded by the fluids. So what's happening is that these hair cells now are riding the waves that are flowing through the cochlea. And as they're riding the waves, you see these stereocilia are getting compressed, they're getting sheared, and that 
is the secret why we are hearing. What is happening at this point is that these stereocilia, which are connected by some tip links, are getting sheared, they're getting pushed away. So when you have a structure like this being pushed, there's a lot of tension generated here at these links, and they just flip open a channel through which some ions can go into the hair cells. So, as we open, physically open channels, and I want to make the point, we have not changed physics yet really into physiology or a nerve impulse. We are physically opening some channels in those hair cells, and then following the depolarization of the hair cells, the neurotransmitters are released and we get an impulse to the brain. So what you've just heard is a complete story from the, from the physical input of sound to the input to the brain. So this is it. You know everything about hearing that you ever need to know. <laughs> Unless you want to study it and get grants from NIH, then you tell them you don't know anything. But <laughs> look, Look at this here, I introduced the uh, ear to you and uh, the cochlea, the coiled snail, which contains the organ of corti. Waves traveling through the cochlea, waves exciting the hair cells at the stereocilia, a nerve impulse traveling to the brain, and you will say, oh, wonderful sound. Or you'll say, that was not so good. So, we have a wonderful organ that is sensitive, discriminative, has a wonderful range, but it is also very vulnerable. And for the next parts of my presentation, I would like to tell you about what can happen to our ears and what it will sound like if it does. The numbers are quite staggering. World Health Organization estimates that 2% of the world population have a disabling hearing loss. Means that this will impair their everyday lives, their work, their leisure time. They estimate that about 10% or more of the population are hearing impaired, and that does not mean that you have just this mild hearing loss that makes it a little difficult to understand. No, this is a hearing impairment that really impacts on the quality of life, 10% of the world population. And then we have other hearing disorders, such as uh, tinnitus, Meniere's disease, uh, sudden hearing loss, quite a variety of conditions that can afflict our ears. 17% of American adults report some degree of hearing loss. That's a staggering number. That's about 40, 50 million people. Imagine that. The economic impact, staggering. Aside, of course, from the personal loss that these people might experience. And why are we losing our hearing? There are a number of causes. There's, of course, genetic deafness, which is a very intense area of research nowadays, but I will not get into it. About two to three out of every 1,000 children in the US and elsewhere in the world are born deaf or hard of hearing. And most of them actually are born to hearing parents. Nine out of 10 deaf children are born to hearing parents, uh, part of the genetic of, um, of in inherited uh, diseases of the inner ear. But that does not even make up for 1%. And there are about 17% of us in this country who have some impaired hearing. So the rest of us acquire hearing loss during our lifetime. And we acquire hearing loss by, uh, for example, an infection in the ear. There's a sudden hearing loss, which is an uh, entity that's becoming more and more prevalent. People suddenly 
either waking up or during the day experience a hearing loss that can range from a very slight muffling of sounds to a complete loss of hearing in the ears. And then we have some other noise, age, and autotoxic drugs, some other agents that during our lifetime can impact on our hearing. And I will spend the next few minutes on these aspects of hearing loss because this can happen to you and me. Let me first look at the noise as a possible harm to our hearing. You've seen this table before, the wonderful range of uh, our ears. But what does this mean in terms of the sounds and how they can not only stimulate our ears, but also harm our ears? The OSHA standard for safety is 90 dB. That's a very generous standard. Europe, Japan, Australia, other countries have much more stringent requirements for workplace safety. So 90 dB, if you're working in an environment at 90 dB, you're supposedly safe. Well, that's about what a screaming child can do to you. So if, you're, if your toddler or your baby is screaming, don't worry unless he or she is screaming for more than eight hours without interruption every day. <laughs> but this, this is used to be. Industry has improved tremendously over the last decades or the last 50 years. But if you look at this, this is a gas engine mower, and if you uh, are old enough to have visited some of the old uh, factories uh, 50 years ago, you would have easily been over 90 dB in your work in Wyoming, and that's no longer safe. Look at the higher dB levels, and remember, Every 3 dB is a doubling of intensity, so every 10 dB is tenfold higher intensity. A chainsaw is no longer safe for more than 30 minutes. Be careful. If you cut your grass, if you cut your logs for your fireplace, remember, if you don't wear hearing protection, you will do something to your hearing. But probably more scary is this here. Is this table where you realize that you pull up to this traffic light and there's this young guy or young woman in the car and you just hear those stereos going, right? You hear it in your car. Believe me, they get out of their car and they have at least a temporary hearing loss and they will be part of the young generation that already now has a worse hearing than the generation before at the same age. iPods, front row at a rock concert, looking over the audience, not too many of you will still attend rock concerts, but I could be wrong on that. <laughs> if you're a hunter, or if you're a shooter, without hearing protection, you will know if you have hunted or been to a shooting range without hearing protection, you know that you already have a hearing loss. This is not new. This is not a modern trend that we have noise-induced hearing loss. Traditionally, the millers, the blacksmith, the boilermakers, those were the professions where early hearing loss already occurred and was documented. In fact, the, uh, the term about 100 years ago, the technical term for work-related deafness was boilermaker deafness, because those people hammering and hammering away went away with a profound hearing loss. Probably the people at greatest danger, not only for their lives, but for their hearing, are the military. And that was discovered by Ambroise Paré about 500 years ago already. He was a surgeon to, um, to the French army and uh, one of the fathers of uh, battlefield medicine. And he noticed that his gunners were losing the hearing. So this was about 500 years ago. What's today? 
hearing loss is the number one diagnosis for our soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq as well, 500 years later. That makes noise the most common noise induced hearing loss the most common occupational disease. 60% of recent war veterans suffer hearing loss. And if you look at Americans that are not exposed necessarily to industrial military noises, well, they have hearing loss due to exposure to loud sounds. And why? Because we simply have fun doing it. <laughs> Remember? Who, who knows who this guy is? Anybody? Oh, yeah, that's at least some. Well, Pete Townshend of The Who, and why am I showing his slide? For two reasons. Number one, The Who at one point in time held the world record for the loudest, loudest concert ever given at 127 dB. Now, fortunately, a short while later, the Guinness Book of Records quit publishing these uh, numbers. Uh, because the Who were then surpassed, I think, by Van Halen or some of the other bands, and there would have been a never-ending competition how to uh, destroy your hearing. But the other point is that he suffered such a profound hearing loss from his exposure to his own music that in the 1970s he founded the uh, Hearing Education and Awareness for Rockers in England. So don't you do it. So noise. What else? Even if you try not to be exposed to much noise. What's happening to you as you're aging? Well, this is a uh, very popular depiction, usually around the 17th, 18th century. These staircases of life became a part of uh, the uh, painting and, uh, and sculpturing at the time, and you see that this couple walks up the staircase of life and then walks down to the grave eventually. But I would like to point your attention to the way they interact with each other. You see proud and standing next to each other, walking almost in parallel. And then as, as they get older, you know, they get closer and closer together. <laughs> and why is this? Are we just seeking the intimacy of our partner? Is it the love increasing? <laughs> Believe me, it is not. <laughs> and, the, and the serious part of this is that age-related hearing loss will catch up eventually with every one of us. And my guess is that two-thirds of the audience here have somewhere between a mild and a pretty severe age-related hearing loss. What about the last in the triad of noise, age, and drugs? Drugs, and I'm talking medical drugs. Uh, is that a new trend? Well, it is not. Neither was, by the way, uh, the age-related hearing loss. Hippocrates already found this. So this is not age-related hearing loss has been with us ever since uh, humans started looking at their hearing. Aegeon complains in Shakespeare. But back to the drugs. Are the drugs now something that's new? Well, if you care to read the one million word heavy uh, work by Avicenna, which by the way was the medical text until the Middle Ages in Europe, he states already fumus tollit auditum, and that of course says everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> He says this about the medicinal use of mercury vapors at the time. You don't know what they were used for. You would take a bowl of mercury. If you had head lice, you would hang a cloth over your head, and then you would let the mercury vapors kill the lice and, as he mentions, kill your hearing. So that is not new either. What are the drugs now that concern us? One of the drugs, unfortunately, is one of the most effective anti-cancer drugs, cisplatin, 
and carboplatin, platinum-containing anti-cancer drugs. Absolutely indispensable. But unfortunately, there's a high incidence of hearing loss associated with therapy with these drugs. Dead or death, unfortunate choice, but we have to make it. Other drugs I'll be talking about are the aminoglycoside antibiotics, which are probably the most commonly used antibiotics worldwide. They are still indispensable in the fight against some acute infections and against tuberculosis. And there is a hearing loss in about 20% of patients. But that brings up another point, and that is why does not everybody get age-related hearing loss at age 40? Why does not everybody get a hearing loss from these drugs? And the reason for this is that not all of our ears are created equal. There are differences. And there are prominent examples for tough ears and golden ears. And here we have an example of such tough ears. Never mind that his clothing is totally inappropriate for a blacksmith. <laughs> but, but Hephaestus is not only a blacksmith, he's also working in the bowels of a volcano with all the rumbling and grumbling. But there is no hearing loss ever reported by Homer or by any of the Greeks. <laughs> the other one is Nestor. Nestor was 110 years old when he entered the Trojan War. And we have not heard anything, not a line, about any presbycusis that he should have had. And we still refer to these as tough ears and golden ears. And what are they? They are examples how genetic influence modulates your susceptibility to hearing loss. Two people in the same room, the same noise, a different response of their ears in terms of hearing loss. Age, in some it will start at 40, in some it will start at 70. Drugs, some were more susceptible than others. Genetics has a great influence. But superimposed on this are all these uh, noxious stimuli that cause acquired hearing loss. So now let me take you back into, into the ears. What is happening inside our ears when we lose our hearing. This is very similar to the picture that, we, that you saw before, the hair cells in the inner ear. The hair cells, here are the hairs, here are the cell bodies of the cells, the beautiful arrangement of these hair cells along these two and a half coils of the cochlea. Absolutely beautiful when you look at it, the uh, stereocilia of the outer hair cells of the inner hair cells. and they're gone. Now that's an ugly picture. They are gone with noise, they're gone with age, they're gone with drugs. And once they're gone, they're gone permanently. And that is the problem. You have about, we have about three and a half thousand inner hair cells, about 12,000 outer hair cells stretched along the cochlea you lose them, you lose them for good. At least you, you and I. Maybe in 20, 30 years it might be different and we might be able to regenerate hair cells. If you're interested in this topic, join us uh, for Saturday morning physics on October 30th. But at the moment, this is what's happening. Age, drugs, noise will kill our hair cells and when the, they kill our hair cells, they also kill our nerves. This is a section uh, dissected from a human cochlea. You see the coils here, you see the organ of corti, and you see the nerve fibers which are darkly stained. And as you get older and as your senses degenerate, your nerve fibers also degenerate. And that's an important point uh, for replacing hair cells, and that's an important point that I will mention later on for a cochlea implant. So this is what's happening. We lose our hair cells irreversibly, and that's why we lose our hearing. Let me give you some example. 
I will let you listen to some hearing loss. If you ever had an audiogram taken, of course, both ears, if you ever had an audiogram taken, you see a record like this, where the frequency of your hearing up to 8,000 hertz, usually in an audiogram, although we can hear, not, no, nobody here, uh, but very, very young people can hear up to 20,000 hertz, and then we start losing the high frequencies, where our hearing is plotted up to 8 kilohertz, and the stimulus is getting louder and louder. So this is a normal ear, and this is what an audiogram looks like. If uh, at Shakespeare's time, we would have taken it of Aegon. A loss of the high frequencies is the hallmark of presbycusis. One can uh, predict what somebody can hear with a hearing loss like this. Look at this. Here are the sounds that you might still hear if this is your audiogram. These are the sounds that you still might hear. These are the sounds that you do no longer hear, the birds twittering or the leaves rustling. Just imagine a life where you can hear the trucks passing by, but where you cannot hear your granddaughter whispering into your ear that she loves you. We can tell from audiograms what caused your hearing loss. An experienced audiologist or autologist can make an educated guess. A normal ear, high frequency hearing loss caused by age or by drugs. A notch caused by noise, typical for hunters and shooters. Or a flat hearing loss, advanced age, some forms of age-related hearing loss, genetic hearing loss. What does it sound like? Let me give you some examples. And I hope that you can hear the differences between what I'm playing to you. I bet not everybody can. If you don't hear the differences, and they are stark, your ears are in trouble. Here is what you will hear in different variations. had a presbycusis, it would sound like this. Who does not hear the difference? Well, I suspect there are some who will not. If you don't, take care of your ears and get a hearing aid. Even that does not sound too appealing if you have a notch. Right. Something missing. The violin is still there, the high frequencies, the orchestra is missing. So every kind of hearing loss will affect not only the perception of music, but also the perception of speech, and that's important. If you had been at this place seven score and seven years ago, almost to the date, you would have heard one of the most famous speeches of American history, if you had been able. Listen. fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all well, that's what you hear when you have a hearing loss of 30, 40 dB. But perhaps you had been a rifleman at the battle and you had this hearing loss. This is what you would hear. This continent, a new nation right? conceived in liberty and dedicated huh? to the proposition that all men are created equal. Not pretty good, is it? We don't, we don't hear. We need all our frequencies represented in order to hear. Perhaps if you were at the battle, you sustained tinnitus, and this is what you would hear. 
four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought to the high-pitched sound a new nation, right? conceived Who can liberty, hear the high-pitched sound and dedicated sound in to the recording. proposition that all men are created equal. Tinnitus, ringing in the ear. If you're interested, join us on November 6th. Of course, what you were listening to or trying to listen to was uh, Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address given in November, and that makes it just about seven score and seven years. So now you know how we hear, now you know how we lose our hearing. Let me guide you a little bit through some of the science that we're doing. So you can see how we approach the problems in the laboratory and in the clinic and what we can do or try to do to prevent hearing or help if you don't have your hearing anymore. So let me talk of stress and dying and give you a very brief tour of molecular biology of hearing. We suspect now that our hair cells die from what is called oxidative stress. At that point, our ears will fight back, but eventually they will die. What is oxidative or oxidant stress? You hear a lot about antioxidants that you're supposed to take in your diet, or not to take, depends on uh, whether you read the uh, newspaper on Monday or on Tuesday. <laughs> but it's based on the very real concept that in our cells and our bodies we produce free radicals, reactive oxygen species, and we need them. We need them to regulate blood flow and other things in our bodies. So they're essential for our bodies. In fact, as we are sitting here and as we are breathing, we are producing free radicals all the time. But as necessary as they are, they are also, by their physical nature, very aggressive compounds that can destroy just about anything in your cell, including the cell itself, resulting in cell death. And the only reason we are not being destroyed by our own free radicals is that we have a nice complement of antioxidants in our cells that balance the attack of the free radicals and keep our cells alive. And we have a number of these uh, antioxidants that are simply present in our cells and that can neutralize these free radicals. And if they are not sufficient anymore, then our cells can turn on the synthesis of more defense systems. So we are well equipped to deal with these radicals up to a point. And that is life as a balancing act. Life is a balancing act between those reactive oxygen species that we are producing and the antioxidants that keep them in check. If everything is fine, we are in balance, and we are in balance between cell survival and cell death. And so far, so good. But if drugs or age or noise increase the load of free radicals on our cells, well, if they take over, they create this oxidant stress and they will eventually lead to cell death because of the aggressive nature uh, of these free radicals that are being produced. And we can show this. We, I can show you in the ear that free radicals do occur with drugs, with age, and with noise. Remember the cross-section that I showed you of the organ of Corti with the hair cells? Uh, quite visible here in a section. If you just look at the red color, you see that oxidant stress increases in the ear. This is a drug as an example. But our cells are not idly standing by. Look at the green color here. This is one of the defenses that the cell can mobilize. And this is the beauty of our metabolism. We can defend and have a first line of defenses. If they're exhausted, our protein machinery, our DNA, our transcription, translation, all gets into gear and produces these defense proteins that keep, at least for a while, these attacks at bay. It's just like your immune system gears up when bacteria uh, invade your body. The cells themselves gear up for defense.
But after a while, you see that those pathways that determine cell death will take over. And if you look at the cells here, they're almost devoid of any signals, particularly in the nuclei here, of signals that will uh, be indicators of cell death. And then, yes, at some point, cell death will be signaled and the cells begin to die. And that's what's happening in our ears with IH, with drugs, with noise. But, well, don't despair. Remedies are at hand. So let me show you some state-of-the-art hearing aids and what they can do for you. Here are, here are those that were state-of-the-art hundreds of years ago. Ear trumpets, and they work. You did the experiment yourself with your hands cupped behind your ears. Oh yes, they do work. They do work on short distance. And apparently they were not very popular. The people don't look very happy in these depictions. <laughs> and they certainly did not like to show them around. And it was the ladies that were so obstinate and did not want to show that they had a hearing loss. So about 100 years ago and earlier, hearing aids were cleverly disguised. Why is, why is this young lady sitting there with a fan rather than just cooling herself? No, she's sitting there because the, the fan is hiding an ear trumpet. The ear trumpet sticks in her ear and the fan covers it. Look at this beautiful bouquet holder. Nothing but a disguised ear trumpet. Ladies only? No. This dapper young gentleman is wearing a nice derby hat. No, he is not. He is wearing a, a very elaborate contraption which functions as a sound, uh, as, as a sound trap and then uh, amplifier of sounds. So that was about 100 years ago or so, where people didn't want to admit that they had a hearing loss. What about today? Only about one in four or one in five people who could really benefit from a hearing aid actually wear one. Unfortunate. Well, will hearing aids always help you? Uh, no. They are not a magical solution for every type of hearing loss. For most types, yes, they are wonderful. I can attest to that. But you still need some hair cells because they're essentially amplifiers, digital, very sophisticated digital amplifiers. Uh, you need some hair cells. You need nerve because the signal has to go to the brain. And you need a brain to process the sound. <laughs> If any one of these is missing, you're not a candidate for a hearing. <laughs> so, if you want to find out more, ask our audiologists and otologists. But, if your hair cells are all gone, and a hearing aid will no longer help you, a cochlear implant might. And if you're interested in that, join us on October 23rd. But let me finish my talk with some other considerations, and that is, since the loss of our hair cells is permanent, since we do not yet have regenerative capacity in the ears, prevention must be the best medicine. And can we design, based on what we do in the laboratory, can we design strategies to protect our hearing? I gave you this scheme that drugs and noise induce a redox imbalance and cause cell death. And let me show you some attempts, and there are more at different levels. Let me show some attempts by operating and modifying this scheme here. And that is, if we supplemented the antioxidant defenses in our cells to the extent that we increase the antioxidant capacity and restore a redox balance and kill cell death, can we do this? Can we augment 
our cellular antioxidants. Well, antioxidant therapy is surprisingly easy to administer. Whether it always works is a different question. But there are endogenous antioxidants, glutathione and vitamin E, and certainly you can get them in form of a pill at a pharmacy. There are natural preparations. Uh, eat your broccoli and you will boost your antioxidant defenses or drink your green tea. Uh, if you follow me, my preferred dietary form <laughs> of antioxidants would be a glass of red wine. Does this work in the conditions that I had outlined? Well, take an example here of a drug-induced hearing loss. This is one of the aminoglycosides, gentamicin, and I'd shown you uh, some slides before. This is again the beautiful outline of our hair cells that you now uh, might be familiar with. Devastated, absolutely gone. If you give the same dose of the antibiotic and give an antioxidant, you see you have nicely preserved hair cells. And the function is preserved. We took, uh, not an audiogram, uh, guinea pigs and mice don't have a thumb to press the button when they hear a tone, but we can take an ABR, which is the equivalent and gives information about hearing. And you see that the protection is considerable. This difference, about 55 or so dB hearing loss, you didn't hear a thing when I played you the Gettysburg address uh, with 40 dB attenuation. You didn't hear a thing. 10, 15 dB, you wouldn't even notice because this is a 10 to 100 fold, 10,000 10, to 100,000 fold difference in energy that's needed to elicit a response from your ears. So this attenuation of the hearing loss is tremendous. Does it help? Anybody here not taken this drug? Really? Salicylate is the active ingredient in aspirin. It's a very, 20 minutes after you're taken an aspirin, uh, it's salicylate in your bloodstream. So we took the idea to our colleagues in Xi'an, China, and we ran a clinical trial together with them, where patients that had been scheduled for treatment with aminoglycosides were actually receiving aspirin uh, concurrent with the therapy. And look what happened. We reduced the incidence of hearing loss in that patient population from 13% to about 3%. So that is a whopping reduction of the risk of hearing loss by 75%. And moreover, it tells us it should be possible to intervene in acquired hearing loss. So maybe we can do this also for the other entities of acquired hearing loss. Does it work for noise and does it work for age? Let me tell you where we stand on the prevention of noise-induced hearing loss. It works very well in animal experimentation. So we know the principle and we're even trying in various places in the US and in Europe to prevent hearing loss by antioxidant and similar combinations tested in industrial settings and of course in the military. We don't know yet, but within the next few years we will find out. What about age? Will we be able to prevent age-related hearing loss? Well, don't get your hopes up, but there is something very strange that has come out of the literature. From different places, an American study said, well, modest consumption of alcohol has some protective effect. Australians said in a study by a university in Sydney that moderate wine is good for you. And there was a European hearing project which also showed that those who consume moderate amounts of wine had better hearing. So if you were looking for an excuse, <laughs> here is one. Let me finish by making some predictions. The next decade, I think, will bring pharmacological protection from noise and drug hearing, induced hearing loss. 
and perhaps even we can delay age-related hearing loss. Maybe in 20 to 50 years, we might have therapy for genetic hearing loss, we might have hair cell regeneration, and we might have hair cell replacement by stem cells. Well, that's in the future. What can you do today? You saw your hair cells here on the screen. I told you what has to happen when we want to hear the sounds and speech that surrounds us. We need our hair cells and we need them intact. Protect them. Simplest protection, of course, is you go out and cut your grass and you better put those ear protectors on. I do. Uh, you, should, <laughs> you should probably be aware of the who, but uh, that of course is up to you. But turn your iPod down. It'll make a difference later in life. There's one very, very scary study that came out a couple of years ago in animals. Animals were exposed to a level of noise that only gave you little transient hearing loss and after a week or so, hearing was absolutely normal. That's what you experience as a temporary threshold shift. You go into a club, you have your uh, iPod too loud, you take it off or you walk out, the world is muffled, a ah, couple hours later, everything is just fine. A couple hours later, everything is fine. 20 years later, if we can extrapolate from those animal experiments, 30 years later, you will be suffering from a largely increased age-related hearing loss. That's the scary part. I don't know whether you should take antioxidants. They might or might not help. But perhaps it's a good idea. <laughs> perhaps it's a good idea to have a glass of wine and think about what you can do to preserve your hearing. Thank you very much for your attention. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.